I need to discuss some of this last month, but I think we're, we're going to continue the discussion today. And Sarah? Yeah. Right. Sarah, I think Sarah has a report for us from O'Connor. Yeah. Um, thank you. If that's okay, I'll, I'll share. Yes. The metal work is also more extensive than we had anticipated, uh, but the one of the main things. So, I think Claudia's oh. motioning that she can't hear. Can you hear me better now? Okay. Can I take this? I think she's good. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's got to be the hardest conditions to give a president. Yeah. <laughs> Leaning over one thing, the mouse over here. Like, uh, thank you for your patience. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Doing those because that just looks terrible. No, now. it's fine. I wonder if it could just, if it could just be. A Anyway. So like like I mentioned, um, this, you know, we had built the scaffolding up the sides of the building for the roofing work, as well as the masonry, and then additional scaffolding was erected to get to the cupola with the intention of reworking the metalwork and repainting the cupola. When we got up there, we realized, um, firstly, that the cupola was in worse condition than inspected. It also was full of guano, um, bat and pigeon guano, we believe, that um, had to be cleaned out. Once that was cleaned out, we were able to more fully evaluate the structure and how the cupola was tied into the building. It turns out it was not really tied into the building. What you can see here are the frame damage. I'm sorry, some of the formatting on PowerPoint is a little off from my computer, but um, you can see that this, um, what's right here was all in guano. So this portion, there's the roof sheathing here's the base of the cupola. This had all been in guano. So once this was abated, we're able to get in here and see that the structure had largely been deteriorated by animals. These posts also, they're just two by fours, but they don't go through the roof sheathing. None of the cupola goes through the roof sheathing. It's just sitting there. Uh, the cupola itself, when you're standing up in the scaffolding up here, you put your hand on the top of the cupola, would move three to four inches. So we had our structural engineer come out and take a look and it was determined that the cupola couldn't be repaired in place and it couldn't really stay without that scaffolding safely. Once the scaffolding was up, it was making the conditions safe, but the scaffolding couldn't come down and leave the cupola there. Um, so like I said, there was extensive metal damage more than we had anticipated. Um, however, the 
the major issue is that the structure of the cupola is not sufficient and that the building itself would need to be reinforced, the trusses within the main structure of the building in order to support the cupola per current codes. So the cupola came off, as you can see in that last picture uh, at the end of November, and the scaffolding came down, the roof was finished. Um, part of the critical nature of this was we needed to get the roof on before winter. We had demoed the roof, removed the old slate roof, and then installed the scaffolding with the intention to do the cupola repairs. And then um, we got to the point where we had to finish the roof before winter. So we had to take the scaffolding down and the cupola could not stay without the scaffolding. I also wanted to briefly touch on other unforeseen conditions. I've mentioned these briefly, but the tower in particular had significant masonry work beyond what was anticipated. There was masonry deterioration that required crack stitch repairs, which are structural repairs to the masonry. After GNCB came out, which was in the structural engineer's report you saw, um, in addition to commenting on the cupola, they also took a look at the tower and there was additional repointing far beyond what we originally anticipated. And there was additional terracotta work, including, well, primarily at the tower as well as some other locations, far beyond what we had originally anticipated. So this work was around $175,000 of additional masonry work. Um, we did have some contingency. This has far exceeded our contingency, but this has all been done. We're not, um, this had to be done. This is the tower and it was structural. We also um, had roof damage. One area of the roof in particular near where the tower ties in where ice and snow had built up over time was significantly deteriorated. There were a few different selections where the sheathing had been deteriorated and the roof deck was repaired, but where the roof ties into the tower there in particular, that's where this condition took place. And um, so we dealt with roof truss repairs and the roofing um, and truss repairs were over $50,000. So of course that's done, it had to happen. It's the structure of the building. Um, so just in summary, um, the cupola was not what we anticipated it to be. Uh, the cupola is not a functioning part of the building for the new multifamily we intend to put in here. It, the cupola was nice. I'm not you know, saying it wasn't our plan was to keep it. Um, but at this point, we're trying very hard to make this project work. We're looking at a couple different schemes for multifamily in the building. And the reattachment of the cupola would just be another strike um, against this financially. And it isn't something that ties in, you know, isn't a major piece of the building in terms of the structure of the main building. Um, that's kind of all I have, unless you have questions. I know we've talked a few times and, you know, I've gone over a few different things. These are a couple photos of the church as it sits now in the last month. Um, so you can see the cupola is gone. Um, the roof has largely been completed. Um, the new gutter is in. There's some new copper flashing. Uh, a lot of the, ma the masonry work, the tower has all been repointed. The terracotta has been repaired. Meeting with the window manufacturer at the church tomorrow to finalize some of the window elements. Windows are coming in the spring. Um, I guess I'm, I'm happy to answer any, or any other questions, but just putting the cupola back up at this point would would be a problem for the project. I was just hoping you could remind us, I think you had an estimate for the, I don't remember whether it was just for the repair of the cupola or whether it was for the repair and the, say the engineering to then really make it structurally connected to the building? The repair of the cupola, we uh, estimate $100,000 and that does not include the structural, the trusses that be required. So, so our charge is Sarah, this Sarah, <laughs> I just want to clarify that we need to decide whether or not we, I mean, as we said last week in our further minutes, um, Steve pointed out, obviously the, the cupola is off, um, kind of an emergency removal of it. And our question is whether we are going to require it to be repaired and reattached to the building as part of the project. 
So that's what we need to decide. Yeah. So this is a major change. Right, right, a major change. Right. right. Um, and, and Dylan was able to oh, oh, right, I was gonna... a photo that looked to be from the 1920s mm -hmm. of the building, which is the, the oldest in the building. Mm -hmm. Right, because we had we had one of the reasons we delayed our discussion of this from last month to this was to see if we could find something. So we do have something, and I think it was by the women's dress and in, in the standing in front of the church. We think this is probably from the 1920s, and the building is from 19, 1912, 1912. So it's um, you know, if, if the cupola wasn't there from the beginning, it seems to have been there from at least eight to ten years afterwards. Um, to me, it seems sort of odd that 10 years later you would add this. So, you know, maybe a jump for me to say, oh, it was part of the original um, fabric. But it's certainly pretty close to the original time of the, of the building of the uh, building of the church. Um, so can we have some discussion just to help people feel about the requirement or the, the um, approval or disapproval of the major change? <laughs> we talked about it a little bit last month, I know. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. you were here. We're not able to attend, so well, I'm kind of I mean, curious the, to hear the The cost seem pretty extraordinary to take on project. Um, that said, you know, I looked at a number of photos, and they're almost all taken in different directions. I couldn't see from many experiences when you can't. In this angle, you can see how it sort of provides some balance to the building, um, which might be lost. We did the tower was hit by electricity. Or by lightning, but at least twice, if not earlier. Um, that makes sense based on some of what we found uh, right. in one of the corners. There have been previous masonry work, um, but it seemed like it had likely been hit. 1913, just shortly after it happened, it was hit. And the cross was hit. And extensive damage, you know, did you work there? And then it hit. But none of those needs to break. I have a few questions about the Community Preservation Act funding. Could you tell us the total amount? And then also, if, as I understand it, the conditions that came with the grant award, so to speak, were um, to complete, uh, to, to um, place a preservation restriction on the building. Were there other restrictions? Like, was the historic structure report a condition of that at that time? Or could you just bring it back to that? moment for a minute, because I think we got to preservation restriction in part from the funding from CPA. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So um, there was a, a CPA grant associated with the project. Um, we had purchased the property with the intention for the former church building to be a restaurant. When COVID happened, um, that we couldn't find anyone who wanted to do that anymore. The couple of folks we were talking to uh, weren't looking to expand. Um, we did submit a, a demo permit at that point with the idea to put more housing in this location. Um, there was, you know, significant feeling from the community that this was a building worth saving. Um, so that's where we went with the, the CPA funds and we had put together an estimate at that point for the work required for the exterior of the building. Um, and the CPA funds were $500,000 with the basically putting a historic restriction on the building in turn for the grant. So the restriction came along with CPA funds. It was a way for the city, I think, to make sure the building was saved in perpetuity when that you know grant was given. Um, when we had looked at the pricing for the roof and the masonry work and the windows, which were largely what we presented when we first applied for the grant, um, we had been looking in the eight to $900,000 range just for those items without the management, without a lot of the other ancillary construction. Um, you know, Cooper wasn't actually mentioned at that point. We thought it was going to be a relatively minor portion of this. Um, the scaffolding and such was included. Costs have gone up significantly from then. Um, 
both in terms of construction inflation costs over the last couple of years, like a lot of things, construction has seen major increases since we first were looking at this. Also, as I said, once we've got into some of the elements here, the masonry was more um, intensive than we had anticipated. Um, so the costs have gone up significantly across the board associated with the project since we first looked into it. Right now, um, per you know what we had first submitted, our plan is to use this for multifamily market rate apartments. We're looking at a couple of different schemes right now to try and get that going. Um, but again, their construction costs have gone up from when we first first looked at this. But our intent is to to get people living in there. I think we all want the same thing, you know, to turn this into a nice nice place to live. And the historic structure report was prepared independently after, before that, during that, after that. Where does that that was come prepared in? before by um, Thaler Riley that was, Wilson. That was Oh, it was yeah, okay. That was done actually before the CPU. Okay. And then we engaged Thaler Riley Wilson, who prepared that report to um, help us with the, you know the architecture and design the plans that mm -hmm. that you reviewed earlier, um, earlier last year. I was going to say earlier this year, um, last year to you know for the exterior renovation of the work. Mm -hmm. I have a question sure. for that whether you um, uh, thought about or have any sense of whether or not you could uh, submit another grant proposal to the CPA to cover the cost of the cupola. Um, the, the CPA grant is just for the exterior. Am I correct? Or correct. The, the intent was so, masonry yeah. roofing windows. Um, since but... it was certainly the intent to um, preserve the fabric and the architecture as as is. And I understand that this was an unforeseen um, complication and something that's much more costly now. But do you have any sense of whether or not you could submit another application? I mean, obviously you could, but do you get a sense about whether or not that might be supported or even partially covered by another grant from the CPA? I, I think that this, my personal feeling is that the city, I, I know there were a lot of different opinions on the 500000 but $500,000 from the city to save this building and help us turn it into housing seems like a, you know, a, a cost reward benefit that a lot of people could get behind. A lot of money to save the cupola, which doesn't contribute to the housing in the building. I personally have a harder time justifying that cost. And I would think a lot of folks, you know, who are looking at those funds would as well. Um, I'm not saying we couldn't submit something. It's just, um, it's hard. I find, I think it would be harder for folks to get behind. I'm afraid. No, I'm not afraid. I mean, I mean, I'm. I really feel that because now I see that this was likely almost at least not from the beginning part of the building, very close to the beginning. I feel that I, I know that. I mean, in all fairness to bring in Martha Lyons' voice, I know she had said she felt like the cupola was out of scale, but um, I feel it does provide a balance from this the top, the front to the back of the building that it. When I see it there, I see it missing. Um, uh, when I see a picture of it now, with it with it gone, and um, so I feel that in order to really have preserved the architecture and the look of this building, that it it needs to go back on. So, how I feel. Yeah, or is there, I forget well, how it works in terms of public comment. Is there any, I'm oh, curious if there's anyone from the community who has a perspective on this. Or I, I I have never chaired before, so I don't know yeah. when the public comment comes yeah, in. I, 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 if I, there is some, I'd, I'd like to hear it. I guess I can say that yes. as the commissioner. If there is yeah. some, I'd like to hear it. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? So members of the public would need to be in person to make a yeah, comment. That, but, okay. Okay. But we haven't received any response from the public. No letters or anything. 
no discussion. I guess we can't take comments from the. So, community. you're not taking comments from the public. Is that Fred? I can't. See the other yeah, it's Fred. I guess Sarah said that we're not. I, it, it said the, the budget oh, was there, there, but well, but I, when when we set up the the hybrid meeting, yeah, it appeared as partly because of the success of this particular. Right. I can't hear anything. You guys, I can't hear what you guys are talking about. Okay, well, can you can you hear me now? Um, Fred? yeah, that's a little better. Yeah, okay, because only one of us is speaking at a time. I, I think that you know we have an obligation to hear from the public, so so go ahead. We'd love to hear your comment. Well, actually, it's not a, a great comment, but uh, what I was thinking uh, of is the cupola being missing is sort of a hole in the appearance of the church. So there should be something there. And I was wondering what the possibility would be to make a replica. It doesn't have to be the original materials, but certainly a replica to fill the hole. Would that be less expensive? Was my comment too startling? No, it, no, it wasn't too startling. Um, less expensive, yes. Uh, it would still need to be tied in structurally for something anywhere, you know, for that size of a piece to be put on an existing roof would need to be tied in structurally to the building. Um, I'm not saying it's not possible, it's definitely possible, um, but it would still have the some of the large implications of tying it into the structure of the building. Yeah, but I mean, I think what happens if you look at the city hall, uh, the towers on the city hall, the top of them, uh, they're plastic replicas. They're very light and uh, they weather very nicely. So a plastic replica would be very light. It wouldn't take much to tie it into the roof. Well, thank you for your comment, Fred. Thank you. Discussion or we have a motion and then we can still have more discussion. But I'm sure that's something one of you. Um, the formal matter before us is whether or not to approve the request. Yeah. So, so to deny the request would be to say that the cupola should be reinstalled. Or an alternative. Right. It seems that we could. Yeah. I mean, the, the commission has 60 days uh, to make a decision, but with, with the cooperation of the DAP, we that decision to extend it. Additional measures would be looked at. I, I know storage of the coupon is an, is an issue. It, it is in storage now. We are actively trying to, you know, figure out the interior. We have two different schemes, a 16 unit and a 10 unit, 10 larger units, 16 smaller units. We're trying actively to work with our subcontractors to see where we can save $10,000 on plumbing here, different things. We were actively trying to make this work, but costs have across the board been coming in higher than expected. And so the sooner we can get this decision, it is part of our calculus in terms of what can go into the building because there's a certain amount of rent that comes from a building like this, and we're not looking for it to make a lot of money, but we are looking for the rent associated with this building to cover the costs associated with the renovation, interior, you know, and uh, the exterior work not covered by the grant. Well, to continue the discussion, I'll agree with Barbara. I mean, I think we have a uh, um, project that's funded by state money, which is dedicated to the purpose of historic preservation. We have a condition that uh, accompanies that $500,000, which requires, that sounds like two requirements, a historic structures report, which envisions restoring the cupola or repairing it in place. Uh, and we have a formal legal document that's gone through the state level process of Massachusetts Historical Commission, which specifically cites the Secretary of Interior standards. So we're in the realm of preservation law here and very specific. We unfortunately are not the Housing Commission or the Planning Commission or the City Council or Community Preservation 
committee. Um, and so I think we have, to my mind, a rather narrow um, technical question in front of it. And so as I see it, I agree with Barbara that um, the cupola is a character defining feature and um, we should deny the request to permanently remove it from the church. How, how, you know, noting that that is a very difficult financial decision, but I think we have a, a preservation question in front of us that um, gives us the tool, the measuring stick by which to make that decision, and that's the Secretary of Interior standards. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, um, oh, go ahead. Well, no, I, I think, I mean, we'd want it done, but certainly by the time the project's complete, we wouldn't want you to wait five years later or 10 years later, you know. So yeah, I mean, my past experience in this professional world is with um, historic tax credits and those projects um, are supposed to be completed within a five-year process, so a five-year time frame. So historic preservation projects sometimes take a long time. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the rationales for incentives, right? Whether it's tax credits or funding through um, the Community Preservation Act is that preservation is expensive. There are unexpected contingencies. Um, it's uh, it's challenging, but there is a community value in retaining this connection, this visual connection to the past. Um, it does, I wish we had more comment from the public, but it feels like there's very strong attachment to this building and to its exterior appearance um so you know i think the time frame is less important than um the uh, approach and the approach that i would say is indicated by the secretary of interior standards is to um retain as many and and that's written in the hsr as you read that hsr to retain as many of the original historic character defining features as as possible so um it's a really unfortunate um, cost event, um, but I don't see it being something that has a particular time frame. I don't know. Do we have? Is that um, something that the commission weighs in on? Is that part of a motion, or what's your thought on it? As yeah, staff? It, this is a little bit of an anomaly because it's not usually like we had to do this because of an emergency. Do we have to put it back? It's more. Yeah. Can we alter this thing in the future? Uh, so that. Should be part of the planning discussion. Yeah, with the property owner, and, and it's definitely a complicated uh, piece of work to both to restore it on its own, and then it sounds like even just determine how to reattach it to the structure once it's restored. I guess it's more time if we have a five year Yeah, I think in this case, I mean, many, um, many of the challenges with adaptive reuse are that buildings sit vacant for a long time, right? So the fact that there's, right, an active project going on, so in some ways doing, there's, Time is money, to understand that, the development part of it, but also um, doing it right, you know, is important. And it does seem like the intent here, the community value is to um, have the church uh, continue in its historic appearance. So um, I think, I, you know, if I was a banker I would, or, a, or a community preservation committee member or a housing, especially from a housing perspective, think about it in a different way, but with this narrow preservation question that's in front of us, it does, it just strikes me as it's it's part of the way we see the church. It's part of what we, how we understand it. And, you know, it looks kind of small, but 14 feet is, it's it's a significant exterior feature. So um, that's how I see it. I don't know, Dylan, do you have any other thoughts from the, your perspective and your local history research? No, I, thank you. That was, that was very persuasive from both of you. I'm, I'm, Torn between really the, the ultimate goal is, is saving the building, which is in, in very real danger. Um, so that's that's the 
the other side of it that's weighing on me is I don't want this whole project to fall apart. I think providing some time to complete the work makes a lot of sense. My one question, and this is based on past Cupola experience, is uh, what happens if the ownership of the building changes hands? Um, because I remember that house on South Street, if they asked me to preserve the Cupola and put it next door, and then the ownership changed, and then I didn't know how we would enforce. But, um, yeah, this is a little. This has a lot more teeth because it is a preservation restriction, right. and it, it's not. I, that was sort of even an arbi arbitrary right. permit condition with the cooperation of the, the applicant in, that, in this case. But um, because this is a, a legally reported document, it does have additional teeth to it. Uh, but we can include provisions for reporting, perhaps annually, about the, the status of the people and and then the information um, okay. as well as things change in the future. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about that second part of the motion. I mean, what what would be appropriate to say that we continue? I, I guess I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. I don't know anything about what's allowed. I'm learning on the job as a commissioner. Um, to continue to work with the um, uh, applicant on cupola restoration or stay informed or to um, uh, a period of up to five years, or I mean, I guess it's a question of craft. You know, how specific do you want to craft it, or how open ended do you want to? Yeah, and the, the commission it. certainly require that it be replaced within five years, uh, and require a request for another major change at that point if that's unable to be adhered to, uh, and also re require annual reporting. Okay, so I move that we deny the applicant's request for the permanent removal of the cupola at St. John, the former St. John Cantius Church and um, uh, continue and and ask and require the applicant to stay in communication about the rehabilitation process for a period of up to five years. If the project takes more than five years, the applicant shall be required to submit uh, for another approval to extend the time period. That was a long motion. Okay. Second. Second. Yeah. Okay. So any other discussion? Okay. Aye. 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 Okay. Oh. The next item on our agenda, which is going to get Sarah from the final minute to okay. yeah, just to make sure the screen's still on and things like that. So, um, is a request for support for the CPA application from Northampton Central Services for Memorial Hall. Yeah. Sarah, you said we had somebody. Yeah, and it's, it's, and it, and that's going to be Pat McCarthy who is joining us. Okay. Um, online, wasn't able to make the meeting. So, okay. Uh, Pat, are you all, all set to present? Hi. Um. So I'm ready to go. All set. Hi. <laughs> I'm Pat McCarthy. I'm the director of Central Services Department in the city of Northampton. Um, and I'm here tonight to request a letter of support from the Northampton Historical Commission for our application for uh, CPA funds to the city of Northampton. Um, very briefly, the Central Services oversees the grounds, custodial services, maintenance and capital improvements of all building systems, which would include building envelopes, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, and all the other trades for 19 city buildings, six schools, 10 parking lots, and two parking garages. Central Services operates the city and school mail delivery program and also maintains city streetlights, security systems, 
uh, dumpster contracts, office copiers and printers, and all city school and uh, school office supplies. Um, I'm mentioning that just to give a breadth of, of what the, what our department does. Um, the Central Services Department is requesting $2.7 million from the Northampton CPA funds for the restoration of the Memorial Hall at 240 Main Street in downtown Northampton. Uh, I realize there's sticker shock there with 2.7 and it's probably an unprecedented request, but at this point, it's a starting point. Um, so, um, Memorial Hall is located between the Unitarian Church, you probably all know this, and Pulaski Park. It was uh, designed by an architect, uh, his name was James McLaughlin, and built in 1871 to 1873 by a gentleman called L.N. Granger. It originally served as a library and a memorial. It, it is currently used as municipal offices for the city. The building has brick masonry exterior walls with some architectural sandstone elements. Um, it is these masonry components on the building exterior and basement that need immediate and specialized attention. Over the years, Central Services Department has carried out routine maintenance on the interior and exterior of the building. Over the last two or three decades, Central Services was responsible for the installation of a new elevator new windows, new doors, a fire protection system, interior structural repairs, a new security system, added insulation and roof replacements, new heating and air conditioning equipment, as well as the reconfiguring and renovating offices to meet the city needs on an ongoing basis. Over the past decade, there's been an increase of water penetration into the, into the basement since the completion of Pulaski Park, the water penetration into the basement has increased. The basement floor is a mixture of dirt and cement. Uh, what cement is there is only about three eighths of an inch thick. Um, the basement, uh, let's see, the, um, the basement typically has high humidity levels throughout the year. The foundation and exterior masonry components degradation has increased over the past five years partly due to a lack of storm management in the age of the masonry. For these reasons, Central Services hired Gale Architects to conduct a building envelope study in 2023, that was last spring. And Gale Architects is a regional leader in its, in its field of restoring historic masonry buildings. The study was completed in November of 2023, which was just last November. And I've asked Sarah to share the study with you. I hope you've had time to at least review it a little. And I'm here before you tonight to request support of our project and answer any questions you might have. Um, I had one question. Could you tell us a little about the original use of the building? It's been city offices for quite some time, but wasn't it... Um... A museum of sorts or how is it used? Well, what I have here, um, it, it was a library, I think. And it was always, I think, used as a memorial. Right, but also, um, I think that in 1905, when the Northampton Historical Society was founded, I believe it had a museum and stored items up in the, up the upper floor. So I think that was a, a historical museum as well until they moved everything maybe around 1940 or so onto Bridge Street. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny, I was just, I, I obviously didn't read every word of this report, although it's um, it's really detailed and you know thorough. And I think everything's justified that needs to be these repairs that need to be done right now. But um, I'm, I'm just wondering, I looked at some of the floor plans and there was a billiard room. There yeah. A billiard room, do you know how long it stayed a billiard room? I'm just curious. Only by stories I've heard probably, um, I don't know. I think like in the 60s and 70s, I think it was still a billiard room. Oh, yeah. There's actually a, a an arch. They call it now, they call this part the dugout. So if you go in on the side church entrance and uh, act as if you're heading towards the basement, 
Uh, before you get to the stairs going down the basement, if you go straight, there's a um, a lower section that was the billiards room, and there was also access through an arch to go up the stairs to a bathroom, which is now now appears hidden, but it's <laughs> it can be accessed through another direction. Right. So the, a um, there's a health department office on the um, north side of the building. Uh, northeast side of the building where you can access that bathroom. But you were saying that it was mainly a library, but clearly, I mean, if it had a billiard room, there would be like, would would it be for veterans to come in and use like as a recreation hall or a gathering place? I really don't know. You don't know or who who, who would have used it? No, so you don't know. Okay. And it, uh, another question. It sounds like the... Um, intent of the project is to continue the current use so it will continue as city offices is that correct correct yes and does the public visit the building very often or is it uh i mean it's such a visible part of the the townscape we see it all the time but are are northampton residents in and out of the building very often or mostly staff um no i would say there's quite a bit of activity we have the school department on the second floor um, a lot of people are coming and going all day long uh, the Arts Council is also on the second floor. They get visited frequently. Veterans is on first and also human resources for the city. So it gets used quite a bit by the public. Mm -hmm. I've seen people come in from Louisiana, you know, taking a tour of the, the main uh, entrance hall there where there's a dedication to veterans. Thank you. Yeah, they've also had some public programming there. The Arts Council has put on concerts and movie screenings in the front hall where the memorial is. Right, started. right. Um, I've often thought it's very difficult to access what was the old library up the up the very rickety stairs. Oh, is that what the library? Room. Okay, yeah. Um, but that, I've often thought, would be an amazing space for a museum or something like that. Um, I work at Forbes Library, and because Forbes and Clark coexisted for many years and then mm -hmm. eventually merged collections. We do have a good amount of documentation about Memorial. Well, we may even have some blueprints. Um, we certainly have sketches of the original statues that are out in front and some of those things when they were created as well as a lot of documentation. Um, so it's clearly a really historic building. It is. A, a side note, the desk that I have in my office I think Jason at the library confirmed it was actually Calvin Coolidge's secretary's desk. Oh. And it's one of those desks where they're, you know, they faced each other. It's a fairly right. large desk. Right. I'd love to donate it to the Forbes so I can get a more modern desk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what I can do about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a great building. I would love to see even more public use, but people do come in and out to go to, you know, veteran services, all sorts of, um, I yes. I've been in and out a lot myself, and, and the, the placement of it right next to the park. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wish there were even more money to fix up the interior to be oh, yeah. more multifunction yes. for the community, um, but first things first, I think it's a good question. So there's, um, some pr critical points that need to be addressed like soon. Um, in the uh, veterans office, uh, there's like 15 foot ceilings and similar to the room you're in now, but maybe taller because uh, that's got a drop ceiling in it. Mm -hmm. But that on the crown molding, which is the perimeter where the wall meets the ceiling around the entire uh, first floor, is a uh, cast plaster crown molding and about three feet of it fell and that's probably comparable to about five bricks falling uh, maybe only a few feet from somebody sitting there and the reason behind that is because of the foundation underneath uh, basically it's crumbling and we've done some structural repairs over the years but it's it's come time to to really invest holistically in this building. There's a lot of issues with storm water management where it just ends up in the basement. And, and there, you know, with the combination of dirt and moisture, um, it is 
you know, affecting the brick. So uh, there's a lot of arches down there that need to be rebuilt. The perimeter walls on the east side, it looks like maybe, I don't even know, maybe the 40s or 50s, somebody put lolly columns because the field stone foundation was not really doing its job of holding up the building. And those lolly columns were put on just like maybe one and a half thick cement pads. Some of those are cracked. And the lolly columns are, as you can see in the report, they're all uh, rusted on the bottom and they probably lost a good, I don't know, three eighths of an inch of steel. Uh, and there's also, we've closed the west side entrance to the park um, because a piece of granite, which is also a photo in the report has been um, just through the uh, freeze thaw of uh, through the winters has pushed that piece of granite out and it you know it's in uh, my fear is that it's going to fall so we you know cordon off the the entrance and that's one of the things that needs to be repaired immediately and there's also a couple arches that have cracks in them which uh, you know affect the structural integrity of doors and windows and that type of thing. So it's an interesting building. I don't think you're gonna get any argument from us that it's not an important building and that it should get these repairs done and um, we should support this. We were, I think we'd be happy to support the CPA application without question. And, don't want to speak for my fellow commissioners, but I see them nodding. Yeah, so, I, I agree. It seems like a good uh, project to yeah, support. Great, great project. And as you so, said, this may be the beginning in a way, but um, you, you have to start with the exterior and stop all the water penetration and things like that before you can address other things. But like Dylan, I think it would be nice to think in the future about doing some, something more public. And as you said, I would love to see where that library was or where the historical commission items were up way up in the, I think it was even in the attic. They were talking yeah, it's about being that. used now for maintenance storage. So, yeah. but it is interesting so, to go up there. There, man, there probably are pictures of it even at the current historic North Hampton. I, I would imagine they have pictures of what the store, what the exhibits or the storage for them was up there. Mm -hmm. Take a look at that. So, uh, do we need a motion to uh, vote on the letter? Or? Okay. Anyone of you would like to I'll that? move that we um, offer our support to the applicant's proposal to the Community Preservation Committee. I will. I will second that. Um, Sarah, you you draft the letters, right? Uh, I do. Yes. I think that's excellent. Good. Yes. Sarah. <laughs> And uh, and I assume Martha will be back to sign it, or if not. But if there's anything in particular that you want yeah. to note in the letter, let me, let me know. And I'll be happy to have it. Right you I might note that that documentation part. is there. I mean, if there's a historic yeah. architect or other working on the project, it might be useful yeah, to consult I, those plans. I'll try and dig up whatever we have. Um, Jason knows the blueprint better than me, but uh, we'll, we'll take a look at where we have it off our end. And then we'll put that in the letter, letting you know that letting you know that we have those documents, that documentation that works, if, if, if that might be helpful. So we have a motion on the table, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And again, nobody here to oppose. So Thank you. Anonymously. Thanks a lot. Pat. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks, a lot. Thanks for all the time you donate. <laughs> Take care. Of what they take care of, what mm -hmm. that department does, yeah, and it's yeah. it's notice it's notable that that's only exterior work that doesn't oh yeah, yeah. that doesn't include mm -hmm. that no I know it's the interior of the construction yeah. yeah so we have one more thing other business not foreseen and I know Sarah you had emailed me and said that you were going to give us either an update or an explanation or of the stained glass windows sure Mary, uh, where so that stands. I I'm not sure how many of you have noticed in the press or been. Uh, following otherwise, but the city has been sued by the Roman Catholic Diocese of Springfield. Um, back in December, uh, we received complaints for, or just inquiries from citizens that uh, look like stained glass windows are being removed from the building. Um, it is subject to the local historic district. They are visible from Elm Street. The exterior of the windows is very cloudy. 
um, but that was a covering that was put over the stained glass. Um, so with the city communicated to the diocese back in 2022 that any of these exterior types of changes would be something that would require local historic district review. Um, but the, you know, some changes to the interior of the church were made uh, following its deconsecration and preparation for sale that weren't subject to review, but these were. So the building commissioner um, enforced the local historic district ordinance issued a stop work order. And many of the windows had already been removed at that point. Um, so if, if, mm. you, if you go by, you can see that the, 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 in, the interior stained glass that previously had been visible from both sides of the building mm. is now gone. Um, they did, they ceased work, um, filed a zoning permit application, which is the initial step for any type of uh, changes to any structure in Northampton to figure out what types of permits might be necessary. <coughs> that identified the need for the local historic district permit. Right. Now the church made clear that canonical law, um, in their opinion, trumped um, the local historic district and municipal ordinances and state laws. So they filed suit, um, they bounced to federal courts because they were claiming um, violation of constitutional rights and freedom of religion and expression. That's currently before a federal judge now. We sure. have to look at the remaining windows and the windows that have been removed. Um, are they in storage somewhere? Are they in the church? They, I believe they are in storage. They've been removed from the site. Right, they're not in the church. But um, it never really came before the commission. It didn't, no. Yeah, so I was trying to remember whether we ever ruled on this. So the, the church uh, was of the opinion that they did not need to file a local historic district permit um, because of their religious protection. Mm -hmm. Um, city who does not believe that that's the case when that was made clear in rebuttal documents. Uh, there was a similar case in Springfield, and this was just um, discovered by the city this weekend, actually, that where the, the church did file a local historic district permit for women and women there. So the, this is not the same way that they chose to handle that yeah. one. Um, so the, the city's stance is essentially that this, this isn't right, um, that, you know, we haven't told them that they can't remove the windows, just that like this type of review right. would be necessary, similar right. to the review that um, the Seventh day Adventists went through with the, the church that they had purchased on the other end of Dodge Street. Um, and, and the commission right. did in that case to determine that the work that was proposed. Right. And some of it didn't involve windows, and also that it didn't move without right. any right. significant hardship. So the, the church has asked for an injunction to prevent the city from enforcing the, the ordinance currently before federal judge Mastroianni, so we'll see what happens, but that's currently the right? Okay. And I was noticing that, oh, it specifically named Martha Lyon as the chair of the court, which was also a part of the suit, is in general on people on commissions, are they support indemnified or protected, or are they defended by the city as well? Yes. Yeah. So it's right. not a it's not a personal. It's not a personal. It's, it's a by virtue of the office. Right. Okay. So the building commissioner was named as well as the mayor. Right. Right. Yeah. I was just curious about that. Too. Yeah. And anyone who sued or um, you know if an appeal goes forward as a member of the board and like doesn't have to worry about having the right. right. Or defending themselves. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, we, is there any sense? Is it you said it's already the, the trial or the, the hearing is in progress? Or it is. So the the first step is the the judge dealing with the the matter of the injunction. Mm -hmm. So that that's asking the city immediately to stop, um, or or asking for legal relief for this action that the city is taking. <coughs> and if that's denied, then it will be remanded back to the city. I believe it's a little bit complicated because of the federal court and. Um, both the injunction and the yeah. local historic history. So it's not an appeal, which is what, what we typically think. Mm -hmm. You know, people will appeal with the historic district permit that goes to PVPC. They they look at what the commission has decided and determine if uh, the ordinance and Mass General Law 40 C was upheld. But th this is about mm how -hmm. this is well, mm -hmm. But interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So there's not a lot of cases like this. Right. So this is very interesting. Is there any other 
Is there a date for the plan presentation to the planning board? There is not at this point. So uh, Carolyn was on vacation last week. Um, so I don't know if any additional permits have come in, but she was hoping to back into a date based on other applications that are before the planning board. So they're not trying to jam that into a. And has the city received the final product from the I, consultant? I do not believe so. I was out sick uh, all last week, but I don't, I didn't see it in my email, but I, I don't want to say it. Okay. And with that being said to us, yeah. look at, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so mo most likely April. Okay. okay. Do you need a motion to adjourn? I guess we're that technically I'm supposed to have a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Okay. We second. I second. And we all say aye. Aye. Let's adjourn. Aye. Thank you very much.